what you'll find is as you adopt a higher level and a higher community of love that you're you're much more willing to accept the failures and faults of others even whenever it begins to prick away at the very thing that you're insecure about what's up everybody it's kate and JJ. <laughs> <laughs> it's Kate and JJ, and this is season 13. Hot takes. Hot takes on the Heart of Dating podcast. And this has been a great season. We have some covered some great hot takes. Just to give you um, a reference, we've covered uh, Christians who over spiritualize dating. We have talked about um, date the boring guy. We've talked about don't marry, don't date for marriage. What is what do we mean by that? Go listen to that episode. Um, what what are some men episodes that you've covered? Uh, we've had some great ma- uh, men episodes. We've uh, I think we last week we did you always marry the wrong one mm-hmm. break up with them if you're having sex and i think one of the best performing ones is uh men won't date women they're not attracted to right because it comes on the heel of me saying i wasn't initially attracted to my husband yeah which and so everyone hated those two episodes have been killing it if you haven't listened to those highly recommend it but it's been really fun again uh, we love hot takes because we're not just trying to stir the pot to get engagement up and get clicks and get comments <laughs> That definitely happens. Like people put out clickbait. Uh, Our genuine heart is that there is a good truth in here that is different from maybe a truth or a message that we might have heard growing up and that we need to hear in today's time. Yeah. So the the hot takes we have are hot takes that either we agree with or that we're trying to debunk. And so today's hot take is something along the lines of you should only marry a virgin or maybe you should not marry a virgin, right? Which like, you know, the hot take that a lot of people have is no, no, I'm only going to marry a virgin. Before the episode, is there anything I need to know about heart of dating events, Camp HOD, anything I need to know? Yeah. You guys, if you want to join Camp HOD, it's coming up this September 27th through 29th. Is that the right day? Yeah. In Asheville. And, you know, we're getting on the heel of selling out. We'd love to have you. Um, it's going to be such an incredible time of intimacy. We have incredible mentors who are coming. We have a psychiatrist. We have a counselor. We have a revivalist. We have JJ's mom. We have so uh, Eleanor is going to be there and it's going to be beautiful and fun, right? Why don't you talk about the fun? I mean, we have JJ helping out as the fun man. No, we have he other was a people. Fun master. Yeah, but we have a lot of games. Uh, I think that's my favorite part is literally like imagine adult summer camp for what we experienced growing up as a teenager, as a kid. Yeah. Right. Is that it's, a good way yeah, to say we're going to have s'mores. We're going to have just so many fun, different things on top of, lots of competition. Yeah. Lots of competition on top of intentional, um, you know, learning and healing time. So it's going to be so great. Can I bring my switch? I guess. Yeah. My Nintendo switch. Why not? JJ? Yeah. So go to heartedating.com forward slash camp HOD to check it out. Um, Hey, one last thing we are popping over on Patreon. We love our Patreon community. We have do so much over in that community. We even do one-on-one coaching in there. It's the only place that we do one-on-one coaching and we do live matchmaking events. So you can join and support this podcast for as low as $5 a month by going to patreon.com forward slash heart of dating. And we'd love for you to do that because it really helps us out. All right. So wait, before we get into today's episode, I, <laughs> I was about a, to say that was the question. shortest intro we've ever had. Well, I have a question for you. Okay. So we're talking about being a virgin and how a lot of people have the perspective of, you know, I only want to date a virgin. I was not a virgin when we got married. You were a virgin. So my question for you before we get into today's episode with Ellis and Daniel is when you found out I was not a virgin, how did that make you feel? I mean, we did an episode on this, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Navigating sexual paths. Mm -hmm. And I think when I found out you weren't a virgin, (laughs) I wasn't surprised because I think I learned about it in your book first. Mm. Uh, But to be honest, I just, I think at that point in my life, I really didn't put that much stock onto whether or not someone was a virgin mm. because it just didn't really matter for me. Mm. Like even it just, though you were a virgin, even though I was a virgin. And I think that's where I would love if you're a virgin for you to say, man, thank God I am. Cause it's only through God's grace 
that have been able to remain a virgin and, mm-hmm. and remaining in his grace and partnering with him. And for the other part, my partner, it's, I think you can hope, you know, and pray for someone that's a virgin. Uh, but at the same time, it's like, man, their heart matters 10,000 times more than the checks box on whether or not they're a virgin or not. Yeah, that's so good. But I still think, and we didn't talk about it in this episode as much, we still have to live in reality which is someone who's had a hundred sexual partners and someone who's a virgin, that's obviously going to bring different challenges and complications into your marriage, Mm -hmm. right? Like that is reality in life of having multiple sexual partners versus not. Yeah. Just as much though, as me as a guy who's a virgin saying, well, I might not have had a hundred sexual partners, but I've had a thousand sexual partners with online pornography and a decade of porn use. Yeah. So first of all, we're, we really are comparing apples and apples. It's just whether or not we had a physical relationship with this one, or it was just an object or a person on the internet, but yeah. two, both are going to bring a multitude of challenges. Yeah. And when you get married, both people are bringing luggage, huge suitcases and problems, and it's your problems together, right? There's no yeah. such thing as your little pile of trauma and bull crap and baggage. It's our pile right. of trauma, and, baggage, and yeah, it's still and my responsibility to heal through it. But yes. you're also, yeah, accepting it. And that's where, but it's interesting because from a virgin's perspective, a lot of virgins have the perspective, I don't have any sexual baggage or trauma or anything. Right. And yeah. I think that's the biggest lie of pride and arrogance that and, I've seen from purity culture birthing, you know, idolatry of, of sexual history and purity above everything else that doesn't define you, Mm -hmm. right? It really, it comes down to the core question of what defines you and your sexual purity does not define you. The only thing that can define us as Christians is the blood of Christ. Yeah. Amen. So, well, thank you, babe. It's really good. Amen. Well, let's get into this episode. Let's do it. Daniel and Ellis Madry. What's up, you guys? <laughs> What's up? Hey, guys. We're excited to be here. <laughs> Do you like their outfits, JJ? I love it. I think it's like a his and her set from Zara. Is that right? <laughs> We woke up this morning and said, if we're going to do one thing, we're going to match. No, you know what that's I mean? Not Wait, who, who makes who match? <laughs> <laughs> the issue is, is that we match more than we care to admit. And, and it's never intentional. Like not once have we been like, oh, you should wear this because I'm wearing that. It's usually like, take that off. It's the exact same thing I'm wearing, except in a different gender. <laughs> this happens like five out of seven days a week. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, to be fair, to make you guys feel better, I intentionally make JJ match with me sometimes. So there you go. We're those y'all's people. Is like an ad- it's an adjacent match. Like, like I see there's a black and white theme, but if you guys both had like the vertical stripes, like yeah, a little we, much. We, we do complimentary. Like even this was unintentional today, but like I do sometimes going to church, I'm like, Hey babe, I'm wearing this. Let's put Eleanor in this. And then you can just wear yeah. beige. And then she Sound pulls good? up close and she says, we're going to match today and you're going to like it. <laughs> <laughs> goals yeah. you guys are goals <laughs> and then people comment they're like that's so cute and i'm like yeah i like it i just own it you know um okay so love like getting to know you guys over the last few years we were just talking about some fun stories of when we knew each other before we were all married like literally we were all single, we were all single. this was before jj was in, the, was in the picture we even spent a new year's together where you guys were not we were yeah yeah, we were figuring stuff out. We were together, but not. <laughs> there was pre-dating energy all over the place. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and two months later, you came along, JJ. Actually, at that trip, I was kind of, you know, interested in somebody else, just so you know. Yeah, we don't talk about them. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Right There's a lot of those people who, it's kind of like Voldemort. It's like, he who shall not be named. It's just. <laughs> Like 40 Voldemort's, okay. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. The funny thing is, we're, we're, although we're in a large pool, we're kind of in this small dating pool where everyone's eyes are kind of on the same people. And as we get older, the matches kind of te- uh, seem to take shape. And 
here we are. We're all where we need to be. I remember when I was single and, you know, you would just have all your friends kind of go on dates with the same people or people who are adjacent. And you're just kind of like, well, we've all got to get married. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, surely there's a connection in let's here Let's all somewhere. just pick teams and go for it. <laughs> let's just all go for it. Wait, Ellis, I'm just remembering this now. Were you not also in our Heart of Dating conference? Um like there was something with Alec and a panel. Were yes. you in that panel? The single I, person? Panel? I was in. Daniel, were I you in it in too? Alec's panel. No, I was Oh, not. okay. No, I was like, I first, I, I know there was a guy on it, but yes, Ellis, you were in it. I remember some of the things you said. I was like, yeah, girl, get it. Who is this Ellis Rock girl? I like her. And that's, <laughs> that's how our podcast is going to go. I'm like, yeah, go on, no, go no, on, no. I was go at, more. I was, I was thinking about that panel this morning as we were preparing for this, because I thought, I can't remember any of the things I said on that panel, <laughs> but I hope I would still stand by them today. It was so good. I love, I loved it. The Alec led that panel. It was so good. You got to watch it. It was like in 2021. Yeah, I'd love conference. to. And so now together, you guys work together and you guys, you guys just run the moral revolution Instagram. Is that? And, well, revolution. website. It's more than an Instagram. Yeah, you guys yeah, tell I'm, us. I'm it's kidding. Yeah. It's definitely more than an Instagram. Yeah. Tell us about moral revolution. <laughs> well, it's incredible because so many people think it is an Instagram account. Like, hey, you guys run the account, huh? You guys have the account. <laughs> but really, our ministry goes so much deeper than that. Yeah. Yeah. And so... So moral, actually, Moral Revolution way predates us. Yeah. It was started uh, by someone named Chris Valentin, mm -hmm. um, and there's been a few iterations of it. Havila Cunnington led it for a while. Uh, more recently, Cole and Caitlin Zick. Uh, and then we just took over about nine months ago as mm -hmm. the new directors. But our entire mission is to tell the world a better story about sex. I mean, the reality is, is like the world has their, you know, version of what sex is and how it should be and, you know, all of the rules around it or the lack of rules around it. And the church has their own set of rules around it, um, which doesn't always hit the mark. And so the goal is to say, okay, what is God's design for sex and how do we honor him through that in today's culture. Yeah. And that's primarily, so Instagram is just one channel or platform. You guys do podcasts and then you guys do events and classes and courses. We yeah. do. Exactly. You nailed it. And we also have a flagship book that we did not write, but there is a book called Moral Revolution that's really the bedrock of the movement at large. And since the book was written and you know, I think it's been updated a time or two, maybe even needs to be updated again, because just the landscape of sexuality and dating and all of these things has changed so drastically. Um, and, Since 2009. Yeah. That <laughs> and so I would, I would say that, I would say that, you know, that message, that core message of telling a better story about sexuality has expressed itself in any medium that we can get it in front of people. You know, we've even got things like, you know, leader guides to go along with the book. We do, we do live events. Of course, we'll travel and speak. We've got the podcast. That's a big hit. Mm. And, uh, and yeah, the Instagram where it seems most people find us. Which is great. I mean, that's, it's a huge account. It's super easy as a Christian to follow along. And then that's what you guys kind of use as like the top of the funnel, yeah. To bring people in. And you guys also have a blog too. Yeah. Like I've read tons Same. of articles on moralrevolution.com. Yeah. We have, we, I want to say there's like 400 plus articles on the blog yeah. answering just about every question, every question <laughs> yeah. you could imagine about sex and sexuality. The moral revolution blog has tackled. That's great. In, in full disclosure, we'll, uh, we'll look at some of the blogs that are written and say, why did we write a blog about this? And of course that's all open with our team and all of our contributors. And they're like, because someone asked. Yes. Yeah, someone <laughs> literally asked this question. So we're going to answer it. <laughs> That's amazing. You got to send me what those articles are privately after, because now I want to read them. <laughs> I know, me too. <laughs> they, get, they get scary. Let You'll have you. to dig deep, but if you dig deep, anyone can find me. <laughs> so funny. So okay. Well, like today we have a very specific question. I think this question's probably been around for centuries, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and it makes tons of sense. And the question that I would ask you guys is, as a Christian, and there's a lot to unpack here, but as a Christian, do I want to or only, or can I only marry a virgin, right? There's so many different variations, but at the core of it is like, what happens 
when I want to marry someone and they're not a virgin Mm -hmm. or do I only look for people who are virgins? Yeah. It's kind of like the this season on hot takes and why I wanted to do this topic is because we have a really big Facebook group and I'm always looking in there and kind of like peeking in at like what the conversation's looking like. And over the past six and a half years, um, well, five and a half years since that Facebook group started, um, I've noticed just a repeating pattern of this question are people being like, Oh no, my non-negotiable is I will only marry a virgin. Like, sorry, if they're not a virgin, I'm not going to marry them. It's, it becomes a non-negotiable for people. And so, yeah. Do you guys think that should be a non-negotiable? We'll just kick it off there. I, I do not think it should be a non-negotiable. I would imagine we're in agreement. I I think the pool gets very small if you're like, hey, I'm only willing to marry someone who's never made a mistake. Uh, Of course, uh, you know, that that it it, it is a little heavier than saying, you know, hey, I have a history with pornography or, you know, or I haven't had sex, but, you know, maybe I've gone too far in other areas. So, you know, there's no discounting that that it's a heavy topic. But, you know, one of the things I like to say is like hope is in like just because you've made a mistake doesn't mean that your entire future is now jeopardized. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have the opportunity to step into all of God's promises. I think that, you know, if we as Christians start ruling out people who have big mistakes and big past, I feel like we kind of isolate ourselves from even the, the central message of the gospel, which is absolute redemption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The reality is uh, when I was dating, I wasn't looking for someone who was just hard stop a virgin. Yeah. Like who do we think is a virgin? I'll probably ask them on a date. (laughs) (laughs) My, my main goal was to find someone who was fully submitted to Jesus. Mm. And, uh, you know, we find that in the Christian life, when you are fully submitted to Jesus, whatever came before that submission, the scripture says that your sins are separated as far as the East is from the West. If God is not bringing up that person's past and holding it against them, who am I Mm -hmm. to bring up that person's past and hold it against them? Now, you know, and what I also, uh, no, continue. Well, I was just going to ask, like, I love that's our stance today and all four of us, can say that confidently. Was it ever not your stance? And did you as a Christian, 16, 18, 22, kind of say, yeah, I'm open to a non-virgin, but I prefer a virgin. Like, was that ever part of your theology? Mm. And do you see that with maybe someone who follows more revolution as new to your teachings? Yeah. You know, I would say that, you know, when, you're, when I was 13 and I'm like making a list, you know, we all had our list yeah. of these are the things that I want, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. And I, I even, I, I can remember it was very trendy to make this list. I was, I was actually in eighth grade and everyone was making their list and we were bragging like, oh, I've got 110 things on my list or I've got 150 things on my list. And it's like, Okay. Well, you know, I think, you know, you have your list and the list becomes a very, very, very idealistic situation. Uh, and then the older you get, the more you realize the realities of the human condition, uh, and also the power of the redemption of God. And I also think the longer you, um, walk with God, the more you realize, Oh my goodness, <laughs> yeah. I am capable of so much sin. Mm-hmm. Like I am, if like, you know, we like to point fingers and be like, well, this person did that or this person did that. But the longer you walk with God and you just see how good and perfect he is, you start to realize, wow, I just did not measure up. I may have followed the rules in this area, this area, and this area, but I needed the blood of Jesus to cover me and make me right. It's so true. You know, I was talking with a friend the other day and he was, he was, you know, he's really working hard on his marriage. He's working hard on, you know, being a father and he was so resolved and he's like, I will, I will, I will, I will. And I like, he's just commanding himself that I will show up. I will do all these things. You know, I will make good decisions. I will. And I, and I said, pause real quick. I was like, I want to present to you, uh, maybe the way that I see it. And I was like, the way I look at it, I'm exactly the type of person who would do all of those things if left alone. 
I was like, that's why you didn't I, make a mistake. Yeah. Make yeah. a mis- make a mistake, you know, be a, you know, a father who doesn't show up or uh, a man who cheats on his wife or looks at pornography or any, like that's a hundred percent the type of person I would be without Jesus every day. And so I'm like, I wake up and it's not, I will, I will, I will. And that's very noble. It is God without you. There's no telling what I will do. So I need you today. And I think that, you know, whenever we're talking about, you know, our virginity and we're talking about, you know, uh, the way our views change, I think I used to have that same view of like, here's my list is so long. I'm really shooting for perfection. (laughs) You get older as being, you know, I got married. I think, you know, a lot of us got married a little, a little older. Um, And I was like, uh, or a little older than we wanted to. <laughs> and the older yeah. I got, the more I was like, you know what? I'm looking at other people in marriages and I was at their wedding and now they hate each other. Maybe I should just temper this down a little bit that no one's going to be perfect. That maybe if I just say, you know what? I'm going to do the best with what God's given me or the best with what I choose to partner myself with. And so if that person's a virgin, that's fantastic. You know, kudos to you for being so devout and, you know, being able to win that very difficult battle. If this person's not a virgin, you know what? I get it. Life is hard. Things get complicated. We do make mistakes and compromises. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I know that I would do the same thing if I didn't have Jesus every single day with me. Yeah. And I think it's also to take into consideration repentance. Like when someone has fully repented, and submitted their life to God and they, you know, are no longer walking in a lifestyle that's compromised by uh, sin, or even when they do make a mistake and they turn immediately back to God and they make a change. It's not just an, I'm sorry, God, but it is, we are, we are making an about face turn and going a different direction. I am much more concerned with fi- or I was much more concerned with finding someone who had that disposition. Yeah. I'm putting my shoe, myself in the shoes of the listener and questions we have gotten before. So, okay, let's say I do find out the person I'm dating, uh, has had sex before. Um, is there a, you know, is there a line? Like, for example, uh, what if it, like, what if they're now like, I'm recommitted to, to not having sex before marriage, but I had sex a month ago, or maybe it's like a year ago Mm. or, you know, something of that nature where they were like, yeah, I was, I had, I struggled with a sexual addiction to pornography and to having sex with people. And, um, actually that's like, I actually dated somebody who, who this applies to. And they came to me and they're like, I had a sexual addiction. Um, and they opened up to me about that. And it, and once I found out when it was, you know, it wasn't that long ago. And I struggled with that. I was like, okay, have you really made change towards a new pattern or not? And it turns out he, he hadn't made that much change towards a new pattern, though he was telling me he wanted to make change towards a new pattern. So I guess my question is, is there a line of like, okay, you know, if they have a sexual past, but it was five years ago, it doesn't matter. But what if it was a year ago? What if it was a few months ago? Uh, yeah, just curious what you guys would think about that. You know, I think that there, there's many ways to approach this. First off, time does tell a story. You know what I mean? So the fact that someone could say, hey, this number of years ago, I made this mistake. But since then, I've lived, you know, repentant. I've lived out my repentance and I've sought the Lord, you know, diligently. I think that's very commendable. And it does really nod to their character because, you know, anyone can show up for a day. You know what I mean? Anyone can kind of kind of live that life whenever the opportunities don't present themselves to them. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to discount what uh, God can do in a moment. Yeah, truly. And, and the changing of a heart, you know, and I think of a friend who I grew up with and the thing is him and I dated a girl, uh, the same girl at different times, different stages. I was thinking, he I was dated like, her in high <laughs> No, he dated her in high school. I dated her in college and I knew that they had dated and, you know, and they had had sex and all this stuff. And I really, I almost resented the guy in the moment of just, you know, he's careless. He blah, 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 blah. I was, I was probably more religious, obviously, than I am now and less grace filled. 
Um, and, and then he got radically saved. I mean, like, not like saved, saved, like whatever's beyond that, like just encountered God in such a powerful way and laid his entire life down. That everything was different in a moment. Yeah. And so I look at someone like that and I think, oh, well, what's interesting is he had had a very terrible past of drugs and sex and all this stuff. What was interesting is he's like, I don't even care if I get married. <laughs> you know, like, like he was like, I, I want to live every day with the Lord. That attitude is actually the kind of attitude where it's like, but would you date me? <laughs> you know what I mean? But would you be open to the idea where it's like, hey, I know you have yeah. a past, but I can so clearly see the fruit of repentance. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it can get, it can get really interesting whenever you're on a short timeline. And is this a phase? Are you a, you know, Jesus tells the parable about the seeds being, mm. you know, scattered. And it's like, you know, some immediately received the message with joy and then shortly thereafter kind of fizzled out. Mm -hmm. And that's a reality mm -hmm. is that there are people who have made bad decisions, who hear the message of the gospel and the redemption of Jesus Christ, and they do receive it with joy. There is authenticity. Yeah. Authenticity. Authenticity. Yeah. Point. I, I struggle uh, with that one too. And it's just more words than I care to admit. <laughs> um, but at the same time, the, 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 the depth isn't there. And time really does play that role. Although, um, you know, I like to be trusting. Mm -hmm. I like to live open-handedly. And I like to say, you know what? I trust you. And if it turns out that maybe that wasn't the best idea, then they're going to learn from mm -hmm. it and they're going to grow from it. I have a question because I run into this a lot. Um, some of these couples are married today and some are not. Uh, but it's been the exact same kind of scenario in both. Guy, he's a virgin. He's maybe on pastoral staff, really, you know, uh, limited sexual past as far as externally with other partners. I mean, at this point, I, I just operate on the assumption that every guy on planet earth has struggled with pouring. Uh, but they date a girl. They're in three months of dating, four months, five months of dating. And then, you know, they're talking about marriage and he finds out that she has had sex. Maybe it was a year ago. Maybe it was 10 years ago. Point is, is he's very disappointed. Mm -hmm. And I've had some guys work through that disappointment. It took them time. It, it did take them time. They were shook and then they came back to the table and then they got married. I've had some that just never looked at her the same way. And this happens with both genders. Uh, absolutely. But what is it? I really want to zoom in on what is it about that reaction that I'm, I'm a virgin, they're not, that gives us the right to be disappointed, to dwell on it, mm. that makes it such a big deal. Is it theologically sound? Is it pride? Is it arrogance? Is it judgment? Like, do you see what I mean? If I put myself into those situations, what gives us that right to say, oh my goodness? I think it's probably a little bit of everything that you said. <laughs> uh, and I also think that there, we have to make space for disappointment in that, mm. you know, at the end of the day, it's a failed expectation. This person was told usually by the church, if you save yourself for marriage, you will be rewarded with a virgin spouse. And then both of you will have saved yourself for marriage. And so you like, you just grip and claw your way to marriage mm -hmm. and wear it as a badge and mm. feel this sense of, well, I would just say expectation. And I can't even fault people for the expectation because that expectation was put there by someone, right. someone, someone sent this message. And so when you have a failed expectation, it's only natural to go through a grieving process of discipline, you know, and, and uh, you know, deal with mm -hmm. disappointment. Yeah. But I would say, I, I would say it, you asked, is it pride? Is it arrogance? There is that that creeps in as well. And so I would say you do kind of have to find your way back to, I, I may have checked this box, but I didn't check them all. Um, right. Well, I've actually, I've heard it said that you reject in others what you fear about yourself. And so, and I've, and I really have taken that 
Um, I, I feel like I'm, I feel like I have the scientist personality where I'm always like just weighing things. And I'm like, how's, how's this going to turn out? Is this, so I'll hear things and, you know, maybe even to my detriment, I'll hear things and I'm like, I don't believe you. <laughs> you know, I won't say that, but I'll just be very kindly listen to what someone has to I say. I do the same thing. I, I'm always just like, that is just so not true. JJ is very yeah. much a skeptic I mean, and it, I'm like, I believe everything, you know? <laughs> I am much more, uh, much more trusting. I definitely believe very quickly. Yeah. Well, and so what I did is I heard that you reject in others what you fear about yourself. And I thought, okay, what do I, what do I find myself rejecting in others or e even, uh, retroactively in the unhealthy seasons of my life? What have I rejected? And I'm like, Oh my goodness. Oh, I, I have found this proclivity to reject people, to reject people who personified the things that I was insecure about. You know what I mean? Like if I'm insecure about the way I look, then I'm going to reject you because you're ugly. Mm -hmm. If I'm, if I'm insecure about how smart I am, I'm going to reject you because you're dumb. Mm -hmm. If I'm secure, if I'm insecure about how much money I have, I'm going to reject you because you're poor. And so I think what it could or rich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <gasps> I think, I think what it could be is that they have, they have idolized virginity. And protected it so viscerally, you know what I mean? Just like, no one, no one, no one, I'm not going to sleep, I'm not going to do, you know what I mean? And then whenever they find out that someone they care about, someone that they identify with through dating has actually failed the thing that they're most insecure about, they reject them because really what they're trying to do is say, I'm okay, I, I'm good enough, mm. I'm, I, am, I am worthy, I am... But what you'll find is as you adopt a higher level and a higher community of love, that you're, you're much more willing to accept the failures and faults of others, even whenever it begins to prick away at the very thing that you're insecure about. So interesting because, you know, at the heart of that is Genesis 3, where we are God and we want the ability to say, I am good and you are not. Hmm. I am good because I protected this and you didn't. So therefore, right. And um, yeah, I just, I, and I get it. I love your first answer though, Alice, which is that message came from somewhere. Yeah. Right. So it's not necessarily always to the extent that fault, but like there's a grieving of a, there's an unmet expectation. And yeah. then, in way, like, it's like we, a lot of us, if we grew up in the church and, and that's usually why we are a virgin, right? Because this is what is taught to us. Usually it is like kind of put on a pedestal. Now, I guess my question is what would be a healthy biblical stance on my sexuality and the sexuality maybe I seek and hope and desire in a spouse because you have prophets in the Bible who are being commanded to marry prostitutes, right? So it's like, do I just throw sexuality out the window and just only look at who this person is today and the, their past, no matter how devious, messy, colorful, whatever descriptor you want to use, internal, external with partners, does it just not matter? Does it just truly not matter? It truly only matters who they are today. I would say yes. I mean, maybe you would disagree. I would say that what story is the fruit of someone's life telling? Like, it's not just like, I just have to take them at their word that this is all in the past. It's there are things about their character <clears throat> that you should be, and their relational, le, relational and emotional health that you should be able to have a pulse on today that would give evidence of true transformation. You know, for instance, you know, we, we talk, we talk a lot of the time about, uh, you know, two people who are trying to get free from pornography. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of this conversation is a parallel. Uh, but you know, one of the things that we teach is that we, uh, all of us are triune beings, right? We are a spirit. We have a soul. We're in a body. We're all body, soul, spirit. And all three of those beings have needs, 
right? Your physical body is hungry, is tired. (laughs) You know, it hurts when you stub your toe, you know, like, you know, your physical body has needs that need, need to be attended to. Your soul has emotional needs that need to be attended to. Your spirit has, you have spiritual needs Mm -hmm. that only God can meet that need to be attended to. And so one of the things that we have found is one of the biggest indicators of health in a person's current life is how well they're able to assess the current state of their need and their lack and how well they're able to communicate about that. Right. So instead of someone just getting triggered and flying off the handle, uh, can they take a step back and go, you know what? I am not communicating how I want to communicate. I'm actually really tired. I had a hard day at work. And what I need right now is this. <laughs> and, and to take that you know, application one step further, what we've seen is that oftentimes people are feeling these emotions and they don't know how to identify them. And we've even recommended, I don't know if you guys have ever done this, but look up the emotion wheel. Yeah. And sometimes, <laughs> like my family, I like to say I came from a family of psychics um, because we we never communicated our emotions. Mm-hmm. Like we all we all just had to mo- do mind reading. Like, okay, like how are they psychics. feeling today? Yeah. It was never really passive or angry. It just wasn't spoken. Yeah. Like we just didn't do that. So I didn't develop that skill of identifying emotions. Now. Thankfully, I was a decent communicator, but I was not good at identifying emotions. Mm -hmm. And so I would bring up the wheel. And whenever I could say, actually, I'm feeling disgruntled. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like just identifying it and all the sub emotions. And once I identified it, it's like, oh, well, what do we need to do about that? Yeah. And so learning how to identify your emotions and like Ellis said, communicate them to your partner, I feel like that's a huge, like, that's a huge leg up for someone who's even someone who has a past. Because if you're dealing with someone's past, you could say, Hey, right now, I just feel insecure because now we're in this sexual relationship. And I don't know if the last person you slept with was better at sex than I am. You know what I mean? Okay. Well, the moment, you know, you, getting covenant with someone who's agreeing to identifying emotions and talking about it. I feel like, I feel like you can traverse relationships so much better, even with someone who has a past. Now, I don't know that I necessarily have a a book and a a verse for that, a chapter and verse (laughs) for uh, that level of communication, but I will say that is a trait that we've seen. Well, you mentioned, you know, Alice, you did mention like there could be room for some disappointment for somebody who what is a virgin was it maybe expecting or wanting to marry marry virgin they find out five months in or however many months oh this person isn't a virgin like I had imagined um that is a very real situation that happened to me on the opposite side of I had a sexual past and I was with someone who found out about my sexual past and that was very hard for them um now it was, it was hard for them in the moment, but what happened was it was hard for them continuously. Right. And so the disappointment didn't really go away. It was like, I, I did still feel kind of judged, even though this very kind man, um, he just didn't really know how to deal with that disappointment. And the way he wanted to deal with that with me was talking about it with me, like consistently bringing it up. And the thing for me was that, you know, I had dealt with the shame I used to have uh, regarding my sexual past. I had dealt with it. So I came to that situation being honest about what my past was, but not feeling shame for it anymore. But as he continued to like question me and ask me all these questions and express his disappointment, it's like some of that shame started almost resurfacing because I'm like, wait, wait, like I've dealt with this. And, and so, um, and I'm, I just want to, see what you guys think. Because for me, what I had said to him was like, Hey, like, I think you need to deal with some of this disappointment outside of just with me, because, um, I've dealt with the shame that I've experienced and, um, you consistently wanting to talk about it with me or ask me all these questions that are more like 
judgmental questions, not curious questions, um, is making me starting to kind of go back into the ways of the, some of the things that I feel like I've already conquered. So I'm curious for you guys, like if the, if somebody is experiencing disappointment, what is the right way for them to work through that disappointment, um, of finding out that their partner is not a virgin? Yeah. You know, I would say that do you have a counselor? Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> that was my first thought. I was like, you definitely need a counselor. Totally. Because at that point, when you are uh, obviously in, in your specific instance, you were, you knew I am completely, my life has changed. This is in the past. This is under the blood. This isn't even who I am. Like I am a new creation in Christ. So, you know, like at today and in this moment, this is a non-issue. And so in that specific instance, his inability to move through, to process and healthily move through his own emotions. Of course, there might be an initial disappointment, initial conversations, maybe some curious questions, but you should be able to healthily move through your own emotions. And when that isn't possible, then that tells me way more about the person who has the clean past, but can't process their emotions than it does with someone who has, you know, maybe, uh, you know, a diff, you know, a different past, a story that they wouldn't, you know, have wanted to live looking back, but is completely set free today. I think it just, you know, says it's like, not red flag. No, like, I was literally thinking that's a red I, flag. I do red too. flag. Yeah. I need to go learn how to move through emotion. Yeah. Because, you know, we're only two and a half years into marriage. And we're perfect at it. Yeah, we're only two years <laughs> yeah. in. So we're saying with you guys, perfect, yeah. never made a single mistake, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I think we're it is only- hard for Kate being married to a perfect husband, but... <laughs> uh- I, you sure. know what? Can, can we just pray for tough. Kate right yeah, now? I mean, I, can I think that would be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, the, yeah, I'm the sexually know. broken one. My past is so bad and I'm married to this oh perfect my. man. Okay, sorry. It's true. <laughs> I love it. I love it. No, I was just, you know, like we've been married for a whole two minutes. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm not going to be out here in the, <laughs> let me give you marriage advice, but I can yeah, speak I from our you. own two and a half years of experience. Which is valid. Yeah. Which is valid. And say... There are so many emotions that come to the surface once you are in a covenant with someone and you can't go anywhere. (laughs) You're stuck with the person for life. And the only two options you have are to experience your emotions and healthily move through them Mm -hmm. or don't. (laughs) <laughs> Those are your only two options. And when you don't, you start coping in other ways. You right. start, you know, you start acting out, you get, res- you stuff it and you get resentful. It causes mm. more relational issues. And so I would say more important than someone's past right. <laughs> is you need to look for someone who is able to process and communicate emotions. And and that's exactly what I was thinking whenever you were like, well, you kept bringing it up and it was kind of judgmental and it wasn't very curious, you know, it it doesn't, we were just spinning our wheels. And I thought, oh, that sounds like a miserable person to live with. You know, and I, life is so long. Don't I mean why, life is so long? Why did you do the dishes like this? Why did you not? I know. Did you not do that? Why did you? Well, you know what's funny is it's like, I'm. This is such a funny example, but it's like I moved to the West Coast, and all I heard for years was how amazing In and Out was. It is the most amazing <laughs> burger. It is literally God's goodness. God's blessing and manna touching your tongue and you will <laughs> never be the same. So I went into in and out with the highest expectations. Was your first time having it with me? Yeah. And I was so disappointed. <laughs> uh, the burger was fine and the fries were actually awful. <laughs> Like the worst yeah, the fries. fries taste like cardboard. Uh, first of I, all, thank the fries you. are so bad. They're terrible. The I burgers are great. Right now, though. I I love the burgers. I love the burgers. <laughs> I think the burgers are pretty mid. Yeah, they're <laughs> they're very mid, as the Gen Z folks say, and the fries are just trash. I mean, absolutely horrible. <laughs> but the point is, is this. I am still today like disappointed every time I have it, and I am. Am I going to go to In and Out? 
and just complain, complain and process like that disappointment <laughs> has everything to do with me and my failed expectations versus in and out putting out terrible. And am I just going to continue to go to in and out, in and out, in and out, complain to them? Why is it not this way? What are you doing about it? What are you guys going to change? How is this going to be better or bounce around all, you know, finding going to my Taco Bell and saying, this is just so much better than in and out. Right. But it has everything to do with me and my failed expectations and my inability to work through that disappointment more than it actually has to do with that in and out burger and the objectively terrible French well, fries. I'm, I'm sorry to out you, but I think you have actually complained multiple times. At <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but I'm still harboring because guess what? I will say this. It feels really good <laughs> to sit in our resentment and our disappointment and the failed Ooh. expectations because and point the finger. Yeah. Uh, it makes us feel better about ourselves mm -hmm. to think we are the keepers and the holders of the good thing. Yeah. We kept the standard and you fell short, not me. Yes. Which is great because it, it really does point us back to that irrevocable foundational truth, which is, guess what? You messed up and so did I mm. in so many ways. And that's humility and living in reality which is I messed up 10 times worse than mm. you ever could have imagined, especially in my thought life, especially in my fantasy life, especially in my heart. And if you would have ever have seen or heard the things I've thought of and, and, and committed in my heart, you would not look at me the same way, which points me to one place, Jesus, right? Not the Sunday school answer, uh, Jesus, but Genuinely, I, I would not be who I am without Jesus and who he is in my life today. And if that's true for me, I bet the same thing is true for you uh, if I'm seeing that same fruit. And I love what you guys, it's so funny how you guys are moral revolution talking about sexuality and your biggest talking point is actually emotional and heart health of the mm -hmm. ability to be in touch with emotions because suppressed emotions and coping with that pain actually just most often comes out in the form of sexual addiction mm -hmm. and intimacy, right? Yes. Yeah, very often. Isn't that so funny? Mm -hmm. uh, hey, just going back, I loved your analogy. Um, hate to rewind this far into the conversation, but I was just listening to what everyone was saying. What I think is interesting is probably the reason why you were so disappointed was because someone else gave you the expectation. And I think the church does that. Yeah. Like the church puts such heavy expectation on that. And then whenever we are left with the realities of life and Hey, you know, even in the scriptures, things got complicated. Relationships were not black and white. Um, or and that doesn't give an allowance no, for sin. Absolutely not. I can tell you right now, it makes things way more complicated if you ha if you have a past. Yeah. So, like, if you were looking for an excuse, you don't have one. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it's hard. It's complicated. It's difficult to navigate. And so, you know, remain pure because it's the best way forward in a future relationship. But if that's not your story, yeah. you know, obviously there is hope. What I was really just saying there is that, you know, the, the rest, I mean, the world, you know, Christians are left to grapple with the expectation that the church put on us that, oh, you're going to wait. Your future spouse is going to wait. Right. Then you're, you're both going to be virgins when you get married and you're never going to know another person and things going to, are going to be perfect. Your honeymoon is going to be, you know, heaven on earth <laughs> and all this stuff. And well, and that's a different conversation. I know. We've, but... we've definitely had that conversation <laughs> on this podcast about that. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> But I think had had the church been maybe, I, I don't want to say more realistic, but not maybe harped so hard on, on you know, virginity. And I think it's important. I, I can't undermine, mm. you know, the value of purity. Um, but I think it would make a lot, it would make a lot of people a little more, um, it would make it, it easier for them to navigate the difficulties of marrying someone who maybe didn't uphold a standard that they did. I also think it's very important to say that virginity is not the end all be all goal. Purity is. Yeah. And those are not synonymous. <laughs> and they're not synonymous. Totally. You know, 
<laughs> oh, congratulations! You're a virgin, but you've you're an expert with your logged ten thousand hours of pornography. Right, exactly. Right. exactly. Or exactly. even even the way that you steward your thoughts, even the way you steward your emotions, the way that you. I mean, purity starts uh, you know starts in the heart. Yeah, and it, it, everything flows out from there. Virginity is a fruit of purity, but there are so many other fruits of purity as well. The goal is purity. The goal is closeness to Jesus Mm -hmm. and Jesus makes us pure. And then it is shown through the fruit of our life. And virginity is just one way uh, or one fruit that comes from purity. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And you know, it's, it's just interesting to me. I always think about the example of Jesus and the disciples and like, you know, he didn't choose the people to be his disciples that had the perfect past that came up to him, like that were like, you know, the perfect students. Like he, he chose people with broken past and he was like, Hey, let's come with me and let's do this a new way. And so I just, I think it's so interesting. We have this conversation and yes, completely understand that there are people that have been um, given some unfair expectations and have been shown some unfair expectations. So we make space for that. And it's like, let's also work through that because I just don't think that's the way Jesus, if he was here today would function because it's not how he functioned when he was alive. He looked at any of the broken people and he was like, actually, I'd rather choose you than this person that is doing all quote, all the right things. And again, not a hall pass to just go sin and do whatever you want, but just to say like, Hey, for those of you that are struggling with Hey, I need to marry a virgin. Like I have to marry somebody with this background because I've, this is my background and it needs to be this way. Like, is that really like Jesus's posture and, you know, or would, is it more important? Like the fruit that they carry in their life today and where they're going? Because I think that's what Jesus would look at personally. Yeah. I think, I think what's beautiful about the scriptures is that Jesus was not afraid of sin. Jesus was not afraid of sinners. Jesus was not, there's some things that like we look at that we try to distance ourselves from because we're afraid of it. You know, we're afraid of what is it, what does that look like? You know? And so you re, you reject what you fear. And I think that, I think that the power of hope is so much stronger, um, than, than the fear of failure. And so I would, I would really, I would really just lean into the hope of, Hey, the Lord has an incredible marriage for me. The Lord has an incredible person for me. This person might have a past. That doesn't mean that that's gonna, that that defines our future. And you know what? I think the Lord can do so much more with two people submitted before him with, you know, maybe a terrible past than two pious people who are, you know, have a clean track record, but are, you know, but have walls up and are rejecting the things that God has called us to. Well, let's talk about how the only sin that mentioned in the Bible that it says God resists is pride. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> wow. God you right. know, yeah. and so I think we have to check the posture of our heart because I do Many not. Many of us are proud of our virginity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. No, yeah. seriously. <laughs> yeah. And there, and I do think there's a difference of being proud. Like I really, I really fought for this, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, and yeah, you, you have a license to be oh, yeah. like, you know, Proud and of pride yourself. like I'm better than you. And pride like I am better than you. There's a difference. Exactly. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, Paul, it's so funny when you read Paul in the Corinthians, uh, he talks about this idea of boasting. He's mm-hmm. like, I boast in you guys. Like, look at, look at what God did and look at what I did and what God did through me. Like there is an element of boasting and what God has done through me. And I would just say the idea that you still have your virginity on your wedding ding is something to celebrate and rejoice and thank God for, because the only way you have it is cause God, right? Mm, it right. is cause God, it is cause God, True. period. Like that he is humility, right? For the weight. Yeah. And that is humility, <laughs> right? Is just yeah. recognizing what has been given to you and what is truly God and what is not really you mm. um, and that partnership. So thank you guys so much, man. I love it. <laughs> So more revolution on Instagram, obviously you can find you guys but there. But also, if you didn't know, they have so much more than just an Instagram. <laughs> yeah. If you guys yeah, have only thought true. it was just an Instagram. But wait. <laughs> but wait. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, do you guys have any cool things that they should check out at the moment? Obviously the website, anything you want to shout out? <laughs> yeah. 
I would say the YouTube. The YouTube is where we're, you know, putting uh, putting a lot of our focus. Um, and so hit us up over on YouTube. Uh, we we release podcasts every other week, and uh, we're having a we're having a good time over there. The YouTube. <laughs> That's what the older folks say. The YouTube. <laughs> no, the YouTube. Are you on the TikTok? <laughs> we are on the TikTok. If you want to find it? Go to www. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Well, thank you guys so much. Thanks guys we love y'all thanks for yeah. being here today nice. <laughs> the heart of dating podcast is created by kate and jj tomlin shout out to our epic audio and video editor scott caro we have an amazing heart of dating team who helps bring the show to you each week i want to shout out kelsey napier our heart of dating digital marketing coordinator and elena gibson our brand and community manager we couldn't do it without them Now, if you guys have never ranked us or reviewed us on iTunes or Spotify, would you consider doing that? It would mean so much because our podcast can get more discovered and more people can learn how to better date as Christians. Don't we all want that? We launch our podcast each and every week on Wednesdays. So we will see you next week.